Glad to see everyone here this morning. My name is Robert Jenkins. I'm the Executive Director of the Brockton Redevelopment Authority. Today, or this evening, we are here for a public meeting in regards to the CSX site development and the urban revitalization plan. I'm just going to introduce a couple of people. Zayas Andre, who will be taking minutes, part of the BRA staff. Anyone here from the CAC, Citizens Advisory? Right behind you. Ah, Frank. Right across the street. Let me introduce the CAC first. Or actually, I'm going to introduce our chairman, Phil Griffin, from the Brockton Redevelopment Authority. Good evening, everybody. Phil. Thank you very much for coming. We also have Frank Gurley, who is the chairman of the CAC. His lovely wife, Pam, next to him. Ex Citizens Advisory Committee. I didn't think it was that hard, but. You know, some people are a little slower than others. And then just the staff. Emily, raise your hand. Emily Hall from the Proxy Redevelopment Authority. Zayas Andre, Cindy Kung, also from the LED program, and Laura Chow. At this point in time, I'm going to turn it over to our consultant. This is really their meeting. The purpose of this is to get comments. As a matter of fact, you only have until Monday to give us any comments, or you can leave them with us this evening. Um, at which point in time the process goes that I will do a presentation to the Brockton Redevelopment Authority Board of Directors probably at 6 o'clock that evening should the board approve this plan I will then do a presentation to the planning board as well 6 p.m. so I have double duty that evening at this point in time I'm going to turn it over to Emily and she can introduce our consultants thank you folks thank you very much my name is Emily Ennis. I'm the Director of Planning for Harriman. I'm here with my colleague Eric Halverson, a principal at RKG Associates. We've been the consultant team on this project. We kicked off last spring with looking, or actually last fall even, looking at the CSX area and creating a master plan for it. We had an open house in March that discussed some of the scenario options for that plan, used the public input from the open house to come up with a preferred scenario and a preferred plan. From the end of that report, which is complete in June, we have moved forward with this revitalization plan, which is a revitalization plan under Chapter 121B of Massachusetts General Laws. There are state requirements for the content, for the planning process, and for the ultimate format of the report. So what I'm going to do is take you through some of the high-level uh, pieces of that plan. I believe it is on the Redevelopment Authority's website. Uh, for your review and comment, and obviously any questions that you have tonight, if we can answer them tonight, great. If we can't, we'll find those answers out for you. So I'm going to take you through the boundary, which is a little bit broader than the CSX area, talk about why it qualifies as a redevelopment uh, area or urban renewal area, show you the plan itself and the objectives and what we're trying to do based on the input we had from the master plan committee and from the public and obviously from our own research. Um, and then take you through the approval process, the next steps. That is, this is sort of the, the this is the last meeting before that approval process kicks off, and then talk particularly about the BRA's role in, in implementation. So, this is the CSX boundary, and I'm wondering which one, one of these. This one. That one. That one. Is that easier to that see? Easier. Okay. Sure. Excellent. So this is the CSX <coughs> boundary uh, of, of the of the area. Um, you'll see it uh, kicks up to uh, the Puffer Playground here and down to Snow Park. We're going to talk about why it extends that far. This is the commuter rail line here, the current Brockton Police Department, <coughs> the uh, Brockton Area <coughs> Transit Center, um, and uh, the current um, uh, platform for the commuter rail. But most of this is the CSX site. You'll see it in a uh, specific uh, boundary outline a little bit later on. And then what you have on this side is uh, an existing set of residential neighborhood um, ranging from single family to three family all on relatively small lots. On this side, of course, you have the Brockton downtown or a portion of the Brockton downtown. Both of these were important components in how we looked at this site. So 
there's a couple of reasons that this would qualify as an urban renewal area under state legislation and uh, the requirements of 760R, uh, 760 uh, CMR 12, which is uh, the DHCD's Department of Housing and Community Development rules for creating this. And I should say, when we talk about urban renewal now, we're not talking about the 1950s or 1960s, clear everything out of a large area and maybe if we're lucky, building something on it. If we're not lucky, letting it be a parking lot for you know a couple of decades. That's not how the state sees urban renewal. It's not how cities see urban renewals now. What we're really looking for is how do you find a catalytic site that can't be um, reached by the private investment alone? It can't be developed by private investment alone. What are those sites in our cities and sometimes in our towns that have just been stubbornly resistant to any form of development? And there's certain criteria that are built around that idea. So with the CSX parcel, one of the indications is nothing's happened, and nothing's happened to it since the 1980s. And then we start looking into why is that, that nothing has happened to this area. Well, part of it's the ownership. It's obviously owned by a railroad at the moment. Um, there are hazardous materials. This is an industrial site, and like every other industrial site in Massachusetts, uh, when there's been a long uh, history of use, that there are hazardous materials present in the redevelopment area. The presence of those materials make it difficult for a single owner to address during redevelopment. And we're going to talk about where um, or what the implications are for having hazardous materials on the site for particular land uses. There's a regulatory floodway. So Trout Brook, which actually bisects this area, Trout Brook uh, floods on a regular basis, and it has um, uh, setbacks from that brook that mean that development can't happen in certain areas around it. Um, the parcel has, uh, it's very large which is hard for a single owner to deal with, and it's irregular. So you can't just, if you think of Manhattan, for example, that classic grid of streets, that's very easy to develop. You have regular blocks, it's easy to parcel them up and sell them off. When you have an irregular site, that makes it more difficult to do that. And then finally, this site is zoned industrial. Um, the, the CSX portion itself, not obviously the neighborhood or the downtown on either side, but it's not really capable of being used as an industrial site in the classic way that we think of it. And that's primarily because there are two historic bridges that the rail line runs over, and those historic bridges are too low for truck traffic to get through, for significant truck traffic to get through. So you can't have a big distribution center there. You can't have heavy manufacturing that requires large equipment to come through. You could, but you'd be running that traffic through the neighborhoods, and that's not the goal that any of us during this planning process wanted to see. So that limited access for, there's no longer a rail spur in there, which there was at one point. It's solely going to be commuter rail. We've heard that there's no intent to have freight in there, which limits a lot of things. And then the fact that the trucks can't get to it limits its use under the current zoning. So here's the CSX parcel itself. You'll see that there are uh, a number of different owners uh, in this area. When you look at the plan, you'll see who they all are. And you can see, actually, a lot of the parcels in this area are very ir irregular in shape uh, and quite large. Um, these yellow boundaries are where hazardous materials have been found. Now, that doesn't mean that the entire site is contaminated. It's just the outline of the parcel itself. So there's two. There's the CSX, and then there's that parcel there. Um, we will find, so you see Trout Brook coming through here. What we do now, although the level that you, um, investigation you do for a plan like this is not um, highly specific as it would be if you were going to move forward with redevelopment. So we do know that of the hazardous materials, the higher concentrations are on the left-hand side as you face it, the left-hand side of Trout Brook, and there are lesser concentrations, if any, on this site. And that's important when you think about potential land uses for this area because depending on the type of land use, um, that affects the type of mitigation that you're going to do or the level of mitigation and remediation. So for higher uh, levels of mitigation would be for a residential use or a hotel use, anything where you might have people, especially children, disturbing the soil. 
Um, a lower level of mitigation would be another industrial use. In fact, depending on the type of use, you might have very little mitigation at all because the assumption is that there would be continuing industrial uses on the site. So you'll see as we start to talk about the plan that there's a different strategy for the right-hand side of Trout Brook versus the left-hand side of Trout Brook. Trout Brook. That is only partially, but is partially due to the hazardous materials. So here you see the regulatory floodway, you see Trout Brook, we overlaid uh, some of the boundaries in terms of the regulations. Um, you can see there's uh, some houses that are indicated here. Um, there have, and you know, uh, a further neighborhood there. There are some houses that have been damaged by flooding over time uh, in within this regulatory floodway. So we're looking at ways of mitigating future flooding impact, uh, not just from the current levels of flooding, but obviously as we think about climate change and the increased intensity of precipitation events and the increased number of precipitation events, one of the discussions that came out is how do you use some of this, what's now open land, to create stormwater management uh, for the flooding so it's not impacting the built environment. So you'll see that creeping through as well. This shows you, the, again, the size and the irregular shape of this particular parcel and the difficulty of dividing that evenly. You'll also note that there's not a, not a lot of access to this parcel. So um, other than coming uh, up Court Street and up in here, which would allow you to access this way, the remainder of the access comes up through the residential neighborhoods. And again, thinking about how we prevent a lot of excess traffic from going into the existing neighborhoods. And then this was the idea that here are the two bridges I was talking about, one onto Elliott and one onto Court. These are historic bridges. There's an active rail line over them. They're not moving. So thinking about truck traffic uh, meant that that would be um, an impossibility or a, a, a decreased likelihood of that happening. This also shows you the zoning. So you can see that this area is a generally industrial <laughs> zone um, and thus <coughs> difficult to uh, be used for the purpose for which it's zoned. There are also market limitations, and, and Eric's here to correct me on anything that I may uh, say uh, that's uh, not quite clear, but one of the things we wanted to look at, uh, and it's especially important for a strategic plan such as an urban renewal plan, is what can actually happen on the site. It's great to go through a visioning process and say, I want X or I want Y, but if there's not market demand to support it, especially when you're looking at a piece of land that already has some challenges, if there's not that market demand to support it, it's unlikely to happen. Mm -hmm. So the work that Eric and his team did was to look at what are those existing conditions on the market side that might have been preventing development to date. And so looking at multifamily residential, there's momentum, but the depth of the demand in this area, it's still unclear. Uh, getting back to the industrial, this site's not that close to the highways. And with industrial, you really want easy access on and off the highway. In addition to access to the site through the neighborhoods, you have to go through quite a bit of Brockton to get to the site as well. So the rents that any industrial use would command are lower than they might otherwise be. Um, Thinking about the city's ability to assemble parcels. So I mentioned all these different irregular shapes that make it difficult for a single owner to deal with. Um, the ability of the city or of the redevelopment authority to put some of these parcels together and then divide them up again. That's one of the purposes of a redevelopment plan is to allow that to happen. And you'll see when you look at the full plan that there are parcels to be acquired, some of which you'll see today, but there's also parcels to be formed and then disposed of. Um, and that's that ability for the redevelopment authority to put them together. A key piece is the idea that in this particular community, it's difficult for developers to achieve the type of returns that they would like to in order to support their investment. And we've been finding this throughout Massachusetts is that, frankly, Boston takes a lot of the air out of the room, right? You get in to do some development, it's Boston labor costs, it's Boston material costs, but it's not Boston rental or condo. Um, a return, and so that makes it difficult for a developer to come in. Now, there are a number of different programs out there. Some of them are state programs, uh, such as uh, HDIP, um, uh, which seeks to support market rate housing, or OCTIF, which seeks to support 
affordable housing, there are other part projects out there. Brockton has been very good in its ability to layer those on top of each other. This is a number, another of those tools that help support development. So um, that's what we started to look at here. We looked at commercial flex use and realized from the work that Eric and his team did that those required, uh, still required subsidies from city, state, federal programs, other private investment. Single family homes were a good use, a potentially good return, but you can't put them on the west side because of the environmental costs to create land suitable for single family homes. And also because the committee was really, really interested in a way of creating jobs to support the downtown area. And then rental units uh, also had a financing gap, but uh, they also had a higher risk and a longer absorption period. So we looked at several different levels of rental uses in terms of number of units and where. And this market was determined at least in the next five or 10 years or so, not to be able to absorb a significant amount of rental uses at that uh, level. So this is what we came up with. As I said, in March, we brought, I think, four plans together, had people comment on them. They showed various levels of uh, development scenarios on them, various mixes of uses. And then we took those comments, comments from the committee, brought them back, and then this is the preferred plan. So what you see on this side are smaller houses um, uh, and smaller lots. Interestingly, lots and houses that are consistent with the existing development pattern, the existing lot sizes, the existing size of the houses, but are inconsistent with the current zoning, which requires a larger lot size. So we looked at doing this because we really wanted to connect these neighborhoods. A lot of these streets dead end sort of on the edge of the parcel. And there's very little connectivity. You get up and you have to turn around, or you turn a corner and, and have to go all the way up and around to get back out. So we wanted to extend those streets and kind of finish off the neighborhood in that part. On this side, this is the commercial flex uses that we were talking about. And you can see uh, one common definition here, that commercial flex is a mix of industrial, office, sometimes retail. So if you think of a small manufacturer creating things on site, uh, warehousing perhaps on site, but selling directly to the public and then the office that supports that. The idea with commercial flex is that you're building out space so that the amount of space in the building that's devoted to each of those uses can change easily. Uh, we also talked about almost commercial condominiums for small business owners that maybe couldn't find space elsewhere in the city and could you create space like that. So these are basic footprints to give us an idea of how they fit on the lawn and uh, the development volume that comes out of it. So that actually equals all of those uh, darker yellow pieces, equal about 185,000 uh, plus or minus square feet. 31 um, lots of the single family residential. Uh, and then looking at a little bit of mixed use here on this side, multifamily with a little bit of office and retail on the ground floor multifamily on this side. Now you might ask, well, why not just load up the multifamily? I mean, the key to having the multifamily here is the presence of the public transit. And so you're putting the density of the development within just basically across the street from public transit. That's key. Um, but we didn't want to put a lot of office and retail on the ground floor here because we didn't want this to compete with the downtown. What we wanted were people coming under the pass here and having lunch in the downtown. We wanted people <coughs> living here, maybe getting off the train, running out, picking something up, running home. We didn't want this area to compete with the activity and the plans for the downtown area. So they should complement each other. And then the key piece here, now I can tell you why Pepper and uh, Snow Park are here, is this pathway along Trout Brook improved intersections here, here, and here to carry people all the way through. Um, a neighborhood park on this side, one of the things that we noticed is this neighborhood doesn't really have a play space in this area, a communal play space in this area. So using the eastern side to support the pathway, um, the park, and uh, carry that all the way through. And then on the western side, we didn't want people crossing the river into the industrial area, didn't want kids 
crossing the river to play in the industrial area. So this becomes a stormwater management flood storage area. So if the brook gets backed up here, it can flood into this direction, and the landscape is designed to handle those floods. So this led into, and, and when you see the numbers up here, these are the numbers required uh, uh, that show that we're meeting the requirements for DHCD. These are the plan objectives. So developing a major underutilized site next to the downtown, supporting the downtown. It's within walking distance of public transit. Um, and it's helping to connect the neighborhoods to the downtown and connect the neighborhoods <coughs> to each other. Mitigating those existing environmental contamination, figuring out a way of supporting with this mix of uses to support jobs and to support market rate housing. And as I'm sure you all know, a healthy community is one that has a variety of housing types at a variety of uh, price points. And bringing in a mix of uh, affordable housing and market housing helps support the services, the goods, uh, the activities that we hope to be have present in the downtown. The walkway connecting Puffer Playground to Snow Park, creating an amenity for a neighborhood that doesn't currently have a lot of amenities, stormwater management, flood storage, and uh, part of this is removing the invasive species that are currently clogging Trout Brook. We heard from one homeowner or one property owner whose business was a little bit further upstream, and he clear, cleared the debris out and found that his flooding problems were solved. Now, I'm not saying, especially with increased precipitation, that clearing out the invasive species and any junk in Trout Brook that's currently clogging would solve the flooding problems, but it would certainly help continue to move the water down. So this just runs through. Here are the commercial flex uses, so you can see them a little bit more up close. You see the multifamily here, multifamily here. This portion of the multifamily and the mixed use has the resident or the retail and the <coughs> office kind of at the ground floor, allowing for that transition, that turn from the downtown into this area. This one, retail can be challenging in um, uh, the environments of our gateway cities. There's just not enough retail to go around and not enough purchasing power. So we wanted to see how can you activate a streetscape without having retail? How do you create that sense of place, the active uses? So this actually has a nice little green public pocket park of an area that doesn't have a lot of green in that particular place. So if you think of yourself as coming from the downtown, turning the corner, a little bit of retail, pocket space, transit on this side, and then walking up and into these connected neighborhoods along here. Um, the jobs in here supporting that. So that just calls out the key components. I will say that into the other um, uh, uses that I've talked about, we have reserved a space for a potential location of the public safety building. That <coughs> was a plan that had been done for the city by Arrow Street that looked at a number of locations of which this is one. It allows the city to move forward with that. If they choose a different location, then that location could become commercial flags. Here's the walkway in a little bit more detail. So you see the brook here coming down. The walkway is sort of meandering through the green space on this side. We've talked about the need for public lighting, furniture so that people who have uh, are less mobile have a place to rest along the walkway. Um, you see it connecting into the neighborhood park here, so there's a seamless transition with the new housing in here, and then a little bit more of a close-up of the stormwater management and the landscape there. And then that, I think, covers most of it. So that brings us to the approval process and where we are today, right here on the panel. This is the public meeting that's sponsored by the BRA, so we can in introduce this new plan to all of you, it's those of you who weren't at the meeting in March. Um, the next step is that the BRA needs to make a what's called a determination of necessity, effectively saying, yes, we believe this is eligible as a redevelopment area uh, based on the criteria that I laid out earlier. The planning board has to note that it uh, conforms to the master plan, and I'm going to show you that in a minute. Then the city council approves it, and by their approval, they're essentially sending it to DHCD for their review and approval. So it becomes a state-approved plan, um, and I'll talk about that a little bit more. So BRA's rule is the determination of necessity, and it has to meet those statutory and regulatory requirements. Planning board has to find that it is consistent with the master plan. Unfortunately, you could have a brand new master plan. 
we've done worked in communities that have not, and so it becomes a little bit more of a challenge. So what we did was we pulled out the four objectives from a blueprint for Brockton and sought to make sure that they matched uh, up or that we were consistent with these four objectives, and so we are. So this idea of restoring land use balance, focusing on preservation and development, we've done that with our division of the site, allowing for Trout Brook to be restored as a community um, in terms of that pathway, preserving the land for stormwater and flood management. Um, and then we've also targeted the redevelopment to the actual industrial site, the unusual, underutilized site. Um, this was making it a make, making Brockton a great community for the middle class. So retain, retrain, and recruit. And so this was creating the high quality walkable neighborhoods is what we're trying to do, which will help recruit people to come or to stay in Brockton, and then creating space for new jobs in the, the Amer. I mean, you could imagine somebody in one of the existing or the new houses being able to walk to their jobs in this area. Um, the idea of stewardship, uh, focusing on building community, and this is where really focusing on that existing neighborhood and the needs of the people who live now, and how you bring in people from elsewhere in town or elsewhere in the state to live in those areas, uh, while not disrupting the existing fabric and the existing community there, and then allowing them to have a new physical identity with the um, inclusion of the tropical pathway, and then the focusing on services, amenities, infrastructure, and that's where we bring sort of all the pieces together, create some new public infrastructure around the crosswalks and the pathway, um, divide the site up so that it's more easily broken into these pieces for economic development. Once the planning, the VRA and the planning board have done their pieces, which um, hopefully will be next week, um, the city council has that role, as I said, they approve a plan for submission. DHCD has the final approval of the plan, and there's a, um, a slight wrinkle in that this also goes to MEPA um, uh, as an environmental notification filing. There's a separate category for plans of this type where you just basically state everything I've said, and uh, they have it on record, so if any plans come forward, uh, based on in this area, they have that information already. Uh, usually what happens is uh, either MEPA will um, uh, approve their piece first and then DHCD gives approval, or if DHCD has moved faster, <coughs> they'll approve it subject to MEPA's approval um, and make it a conditional on that. The key piece is once DHCD has approved the plan, it becomes an active plan and it becomes an actionable plan. And so. Uh, while there are pieces in here that you might be able to do without the HCD approval, the vast majority of the authority of the redevelopment to authority to work on this is contingent upon DHCD approval. And then finally, once it is an active plan, the BRA has a role in implementation. So they can acquire land um, to assist developers in, in assembling these parcels. They can also acquire land and work with the city to create the public infrastructure. Um, they can work to relocate incompatible uses from other areas of the city to this area. One of the things we talked about is um, smaller businesses, as I mentioned earlier, that maybe don't have a place in the city or are in um, buildings that don't really work for their needs could be able to move in here. Um, and that provides an opportunity for better space for them. Uh, the BRA can support the zoning changes. Obviously, that's a city action, but having the support of the BRA to allow these recommended uses, in addition to uh, creating the different lot sizes for the small, smaller houses that we talked about, uh, we would also need to add commercial flex as uh, a new use in the city's uh, zoning code. And then supporting the creation of design guidelines, so um, setting up the standards by which these parcels would be <coughs> over time so that you retain that consistency on the neighborhood side with the existing context. You don't have something that's sort of out of the ordinary for it. And uh, along Court Street, especially, having some sort of design guidelines to protect that public realm. Um, so this is looking at the acquisition. So obviously the CSX parcel is the larger one. We've identified some that over time could be acquired. Uh, you'll see some of these parcels are in pink. That means that the you can't quite see it from 
maybe we can a little bit from there. That just means that we're looking at an easement. So for example, there's a, a corner here of a property. It's not that we, the um, BRA would buy the land, but they'd buy the right to extend the um, path along that corner of the property. Um, they also can work with the city or work with, uh, you know, by themselves to improve this infrastructure. One of the things of looking at the development of the area is the development of some of these other parcels may help support the cost of creating that infrastructure. And that's it. That's what I have for you tonight. That's a, sort of the high level of the plan. And we're happy, all of us, to answer any questions that you may have. Good job, Emily. Thank you. There is, as I've kind of Rob May, I am the board at the Redevelopment Authority. I think this is this is. I want you to know that this is not something that's in stone. It is a plan. There are still several things. Acquisition being one of the biggest, but zoning probably being the second largest. As Emily pointed out, the city does not have a zoning ordinance for commercial flex. We don't have a zoning ordinance for smaller housing lots. Um, Rob, help me out. There was a third one that we, zoning piece that we actually need as well. Um, mixed use. Mixed use in order to make this even come to fruition. And I know we have a number of city councilors that are in the audience as well. Um, and this is really going to be a presentation to you, should the board approve it and then the planning board. Um, at this point in time, I'm not sure if you guys have any questions. Believe me, this is a very huge task for the redevelopment authority. But if you have any questions, now's the time. Yes, ma'am. I have a question regarding the um, contamination on the site. That's a big problem. Mm -hmm. um, looking towards the city to purchase this property. What are, what are the thoughts on um, CSX? kicking money in to clean up this? All doors and options are available and open. Um, going also EPA has Brownfields money we'll probably look to apply for as well. Uh, any developer coming onto this site, there's probably gonna be some type of agreement. As Emily pointed out in her presentation, some of this site is not as contaminated as others. And so if, where it's the light industrial, I think we've already planned to put where it's contaminated for light industrial, that's where it'll go. The more, how should I say, not as contaminated sites will be for the residential, which is less expensive. All of this is driven by money, you know, and the availability of funding. What are the contaminants that have been found and how deep do they go? I wouldn't know that and we probably have to do some testing should this get approved. That gets once again into big money coming up, finding a developer, Cindy and then determining what the level of contamination is. There's probably some level already, CSX probably already knows, mm -hmm. but um, we'll get that information as we proceed. Rob May? No, uh, the State um, Department of Environmental Protection, DEP, yes, um, has a website and all of the environmental data from CSX and Brock and Iron are on there. So the state has, <clears throat> uh, or DEP and US EPA have worked with CSX and they've gone through a lot of the remediation process already. And they've gotten to a place where they've um, said, we're kind of done with our, our remediation. Uh, and they've put on what's called an activities and use limitation uh, agreement. And so it's cleaned up to the environmental standards that will allow commercial and industrial uses. Um, Brock and Iron and Steel is a little bit further behind that. They have a lot, they have a little bit more work to done, to done, to do, <laughs> but you'll also see a, a uh, uh, activity and use limitations there uh, also. Now, that just means that they've gotten to a certain level and they, they want to walk away from it. Um, we would, I think, the Redevelopment Authority would want to work with those two owners to either um, discount the, the price of the land or 
find other funding sources if we need to <coughs> do further remediation. And, and another thing to address Deb's question, if I can, I'm sorry I've taken away your thunder. That's why I wanted to The, the point now. of the redevelopment uh, urban renewal district is not necessarily that the, the city or the BRA is going to acquire the property, but we would like to cause the disposition of the property from CSX. Mm -hmm. If they find somebody who's going to build you know, something similar to what we want, they can sell to them. That's, that's fine. We want some control. And that's where the urban renewal plan comes in. So we don't have, we, I'm sorry, the redevelopment authority doesn't have urban renewal, uh, eminent domain power over the railroad. However, the minute the railroad sells that property, they do. And because we have a plan and the urban renewal and then the zoning, it kind of forces the new developer, the new owner, into doing what we, the community, want to happen there. So we are not going to purchase this land as was proposed last year and last year and the year before. Let's just say that I would just say <coughs> at that this time. It's 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 an option that we the how should I say the path of the path we would most likely not want to take. Mm -hmm. However, if we find a the the best path, path of least resistance, to find the developer that wants to develop this and let them do the acquisition, let them go through the negotiation with CSX take the sites, and any other private sites that are here as well. Right. Matt, on, on the CSX site, Mass DOT has the private first refusal because they're a transportation, transportation. agency. Mm -hmm. uh, there is an opportunity that they could acquire the site and then find a way to deed it over to the city. And I'm not saying that BRA or the city won't put any money into it, but what I'm saying is, is that we would like the private market to work in partnership with us the city and the redevelopment authority, as opposed to us being the only so, one out there. Right. Okay. There's another question. Yes. Do you have plans um, on how to raise funds? Uh, do you, are you selling <coughs> parcels, properties? Are you having once, fundraisers? What do you know? Once again, the big sale. The, big sale. <laughs> the the goal here at this point in time is not to raise funds. Our goal, mostly right now, is process try to identify site control. For us, that doesn't require any money. The process doesn't require any money. The plan doesn't require any money at this point in time. As we alluded to, as Rob just alluded to, what we'd like to do, the best case scenario, is have a developer, a private developer, come in and put all their investment dollars up front. Rob? I can add something to that. Sure. So to, you will see in the plan, there's a financial plan that's required by DHCD. So it identifies what the cost would be if you acquired everything on that list at its current assessed value according to the city. Um, there is no obligation for the redevelopment authority to acquire everything on the list. We have to, under the regulations, we have to identify okay. anything that they're considering acquiring, but they are not bound by that. If they didn't, if, say all of those properties, redeveloped under uh, private investment, but at some point you do an amendment to the plan to take them off. So that's part of it. The other thing that's part of the financial plan is we've identified as many relevant grants as we possibly can so that should the city or the redevelopment authority wish to expend funds on this, they have a list of places they can go. But again, as you said, the, the primary goal is for the private market to see this and say, oh, that's a great idea. We should do that and let the redevelopment authority be a partner to that rather than the prime mover. Council Boulevard. Nice presentation, Emily. Thank you. Thank you. Is that um, available on hard copy if somebody downloaded or whatever? You can download it on our website or Ann, you can come to our office. And uh, I no, I just, you know, just want yeah, people anyone. who might want to see it in writing. <coughs> if you want to have a copy in hand, just let us know. Um, yes. Can I ask you a question, Mr. Jenkins? Um, Mr. Jenkins. Alston CSX, yeah, Conrail, yeah, whatever you want to call it, um, they're doing a massive development out there. They ran into the same problem. Has anybody gone to them and seen how they remediated the whole thing? I think Mr. May has spent some time out there talking with them as well. I'm not so much interested, but yeah. I, re I really I, think our plan fits broadly. I would agree, and that's why we've. 
I mean, we've been doing this now since last fall. Yeah, last fall. So this is why we really do need the input um, from the community. Yes. So how, long, how long it took a time frame? How long it going to take to get to get done? If it's approved by City Council, it'll be another 10 year plan. 20. 20. Yeah. 10. Is it 20? Do we have 20? 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, yeah, 20 year plan. 20 year plan. Okay. And by so. then it will all be cleaned up. Hopefully. <laughs> it, doesn't <laughs> it doesn't take long to clean it up once you know what's out there. That's right. It once you know what's out there, there it doesn't take long to clean it up. But there are some things that can happen faster than others. Yes. And where we can plug and play and make things happen, I think that that is, you know, best for the, for the city um, and for the communities if, if there are some easy wins and especially in uh, finding a way to implement the, the green space in particular, yes. in particular, excuse me, uh, to provide the flood storage and to really connect two neighborhoods that have been disconnected from each other and I think for that's, 100 years. Yeah, really. and I think that's really key because as I think we pointed out and we may have had some folks from the neighborhoods, they used to have a lot of flooding in this area and they think that development, the infrastructure will help this part of the city and the neighborhood. Uh, just the infrastructure alone, improvements, uh, will help the neighborhood. Yes? I noticed the um, market rate and affordable rate housing. Do you know what the ratio is going to be on that? At this point, no idea. Um, we know that, like all They'll of come in when they make offers and yeah. It will be a mixed income, mixed income development. Mm -hmm. And that's our plan. You know? Yes. It's part of reducing the flooding um, when Trout Brook is, um, you know, the whole area is done. Would that include dredging? I don't think so. No, that brook is not that deep. I don't think, uh, I don't think it will be any dredging. Um, there may be some, um, not necessarily coverts, widening but the widening channel. the channel. Yeah. Right. Exactly. We did not anticipate that. We also have some members from the CAC. Frank, who's the chair. Um, Frank, any comments you want to add? Because you guys are very influential in one putting together these meetings, but also getting community comments. I think I think one of the things that we looked at was, um, as Rob said, and, and you said connecting the neighborhoods together. Okay, and that was very important. The other part was being able to connect off a playground with the other playground and so. having a nice green area, you know, um, uh, to work with. And that was very important to us as well. And the other part of it was the mix of um, having apartments, for lack of a better word, and uh, a neighborhood of single family homes, okay, that connected to the other neighborhood. And that was very important. So um, that, that's the reason why I like this particular plan. I'm just curious as to uh, why the, the west wing of that development is in part, or would it be part of the downtown revitalization plan? And can you speak to that? Yes, absolutely. So it's really divorced from the downtown by the rail line. So it's not a, a real clean connection because of that. There is a um, tiny little passageway, uh, as we were looking at it, one of my colleagues said, we should make that two-way for vehicular transportation. I said, I've seen it. You're not going to get two cars packing, passing there. But it makes an excellent outlet, one way only for um, cars, makes a much better outlet for pedestrians. So we, as we thought about it, and again, to make sure that we weren't taking away from the downtown, we thought, do we put mixed use into the center of the site? No, we really want that to be the industrial. So we're kind of forcing people to leave the buildings and go into the downtown to get food or services or whatever. So you can see one of the reasons an urban renewal plan is that 20 year lifetime is it takes a long time to see the development come through and the impact really happen. And so DHCD gives us that time to do it. But you can see over time, as this becomes more successful, there's that demand that starts to spring up in that area and that's what we're hoping for and, and that's 
part of the idea behind the commercial flex. Exactly. Now, um, right now, we know there's not a big demand for office space in Brockton. But this area sits on an enormous fiber optic cable bundle, whatever you want to call it. I'm not that tech savvy. Um, that, you know, we're all on Comcast in Brockton. And you maybe get one gigabyte of data on business Comcast. Um, that's nothing. So this is a thousand gigabyte fiber that runs through the city. This is Cambridge quality, high capacity, high speed fiber. It, it stretches from downtown Boston to New York City. It's the, the fiber that people like Fidelity and, and uh, all the big banks are, are using. So it daylights here in Brockton. And Verizon has a fiber that runs through here. And Ver there's a big Verizon building with a, a tower on top of that. So if we could tap into that fiber and make that available both in downtown and in this district, we think that at some point in time, we might be able to attract those larger back office kind of uses and eventually get creative businesses and things that need that fiber. So the commercial flex, you might see you know, one of those steel frame buildings there, not real glamorous, but it's got maybe a printing shop and a you know, contractor's office and you know, a couple of other different things in there. But at, as the property values and the demand rises, the flex comes in is that that site can then be easily scraped clean because it's a relatively inexpensive building. And then we could see, could see, you know, vertical office development. Ten years. That fiber is a competitive advantage. Uh, when you look at other uh, communities and how they draw businesses in, having that high-speed fiber that close is a huge competitive advantage. And we've got two providers, so there's incredible any other comments, questions? I said earlier you have until Monday, but actually you have until Wednesday, 3 o'clock, to get your comments to us. Um, I think um, you know the website. I was going to say my email address, but you can just, you, everybody's listed on our website, so any comments, you don't want to address them tonight or you want to have time to think about it. You can call either Zayas or I if you need a copy of the plan. Share with your friends. Office. Yeah, right. Thank you. Um, if there are no other comments, you guys want to stick around? Unfortunately, I don't serve food because the federal government doesn't let me. So, all right. But thank you guys for coming this evening. I really do appreciate it. Thank you, Mal.